here I've got a uh, Kodak Retina 2C nice rangefinder camera this one's fairly early manufacture you can tell that because it lacks the shield around the film release button and if you look at the shutter in this case you'll notice that instead of the aperture numbers appearing at the top here you just have a white dot that comes up there and your aperture numbers are visible at the bottom of the shutter the, uh, there are other differences in that shutter too of course this one has the, the 10 blade diaphragm not the 5 blade diaphragm that uh, the later models had so what's this camera here for? well it's here for servicing of course it needs to be stripped down completely and returned back to a working condition as it would have been when it left the factory any particular problems with this one? well yes the shutter is certainly sluggish and if you look closely there you'll see those shutter blades are very very marked so if we try this in a nice slow speed let's set it to a second and you'll notice there probably that those shutter blades didn't snap shut they sort of closed in a fairly relaxed manner that's not right they should snap shut so this needs to be sorted out and I think I'll start with the shutter and we'll work our way through that well the first problem you face when you're wanting to service the shutter on a camera like this and I mean service in the correct fashion not just poke and prod from the front is you need to remove the shutter from the camera body now the shutter is held by a retaining ring from the back but that retaining ring is quite thin and it resides in that space between the lens and the lens mount close that you can get a bit of a closer look so there's really not much space down here and you cannot get a traditional type of uh, lens spanner down there to engage the notches in that retaining ring so what you need to do is you need a special tool now a special tool looks something like this you can see it's got a deep recess to go around that rear lens group and it has two points or pins at the end here to engage the notches in the retaining ring this is one that I was given a uh, friend of mine had this made he was also repairing a lot of retinas he had one made for himself by a friend and he had this one made for me as well and it replaced an earlier one that I'd made myself which was by no means as pretty looking this was one a Belgian tool this was available on eBay some years ago Mr Belgian no longer makes them unfortunately basically it's the same same idea same pattern you have it deep recess at the back to go around the lens you have the two protrusions which will engage the retaining ring and if you haven't guessed the reason that they're chewed off and they're not just completely circular is that you have to get them through the film gate and if they were circular you wouldn't be able to do that so there's the tools I use for removing the retaining ring and um, if you can locate one of these all well and good if you can find somebody you know somebody who's got a lathe you can get them to make you something that'll do that job perhaps you have a lathe yourself and you may be able to do that anyway I've got some dimensions on my website I'll post a link in the description of the video and uh, that'll give you some idea of the dimensions needed dimensions needed for these tools because obviously they have to engage with the retaining ring and there's no use if they're too big they won't fit down in the slot in the back of the camera if they're too narrow they won't go over the lens lots of fun I'll start by opening the front of the camera 
put my spanner down carefully over the rear of the lens and into the retaining ring. It's engaged with the notches and with a bit of luck it'll come loose. Yep. Some of them are tighter than others. If people have been too enthusiastic with their black paint in the back of the camera, you'll find that that can be very awkward to get out. So here's our shutter. Here's our retaining ring. You can see the notches there. It only has two notches in those retaining rings. Some cameras have four notches. Two notches are sufficient as long as they're good. So there's our shutter removed from the camera body and I can put the camera body to one side. The first order of the day is to remove the lens. So I'll just unbone at the front. I'll remove that retaining ring. Make it easier to get to the lens. Gather up the shims. Don't lose those shims, you'll need those. And see if the rear group will unscrew. Usually it's just finger tight. Sometimes they're a bit tighter than that. You need to uh, use a friction tool. Or a rubber glove works well. If you've got a rubber glove on, that'll allow you to get a very good grip on that lens and unscrew it. So, I'm going to have a close look at the shutter now and see what I've got. I'm looking at the state of the diaphragm. Seems a bit dirty, a bit sticky perhaps. Now, the diaphragm and the shutter are clipped together at this point so that when you move the shutter speed, let's get this in the middle of the range somewhere. That'll do. As you move this shutter speed ring, it should move the aperture ring too. But you may notice that this is hopping over from one position to another. This is our EV values here. Now that's popping backwards and forwards there either side of the EV11. If you moved it quicker you'd find it shifted even more. That's because the diaphragm here is too stiff and the spring here may lack enough tension to uh, engage correctly with the shutter speed ring. But most likely it's down to friction in that uh, diaphragm. So from the front of the shutter, first thing we strike is there's a screw here, a lock screw, which locks the retaining ring at the front. It's quite small and it's very short. Take great care not to lose that screw. It's not even going to focus on it here. You can just see it's stuck on the end of my screwdriver. Take great care not to lose that. Easily lost. And anything that's easily lost, there are no spares because people have already used them up. So the retaining ring I'm removing, I'm unscrewing this, and you'll see I'm using a wooden toothpick. Don't use the tip of a screwdriver or your tweezers because when you slip, you'll end up making a mess. This one looks quite tidy. It means that whoever's been in here previously was suitably careful. So I can remove that retaining ring. Here's the lens mount at the front. Now this is unnaturally clean. Normally there is a great smear of graphite grease across here. Someone's cleaned this and they haven't bothered to put anything there at all. Because this is a, one of the shutters with the 10 blade diaphragm and with the aperture settings only showing at the bottom of the shutter, not at the top, it doesn't have a repeater. This is only a simple mechanism. So there's no slide in here that couples to anything. That all looks nice and clean. And this piece here is the shutter speeds settings cam plate and the shutter speeds are set basically by the retard gear train, the pin on there, following these contours to the different settings. Right, in from here, well this little piece here 
stops you depressing the shutter release if the shutter's not cocked. Sometimes that's missing in shutters because people sometimes don't know what it is and don't know where it came from and it doesn't seem to stop the shutter working so they leave it out and the camera goes on without it. Right, so I'll unhook that spring that should lift off that post. And we're deeper in. Here's the cat little uh, settings pinion for the cam, for the main cam here, and this is the main spring. I'll just unhook that because I suspect the spring is very tired. It certainly is. If we take that tab there as being at 12 o'clock, this is right around at about the 4 o'clock position, this little upright here. That's a, that's a tired spring. That should be right around at about the 2 o'clock position in the case of a new spring, and more typically at about 3 o'clock in the case of a spring that's going to be provide adequate service. If the spring is too tired like this one, what you'll find is that the shutter sort of works okay, but the last bit where it's closing the blades, it, it simply lacks enough tension to do that last bit in a snappy fashion. When it's further round, it's under more tension and it'll, things move quickly. Right, so in from here, we can remove the shutter release lever. And we turn that main drive cam around a bit. We can lift that off its post. Now that is well greased with graphite grease, so the shutter was not entirely unlubricated. The retard gear train is held in place with two screws, one that forms the pivot at this end, that end, and a small, shorter one at this end, which goes through a, an enlarged hole in the base plate of the retard gear train, which allows it to move so that you can swing the retard gear train in for greater engagement or outwards for lesser engagement in order to control the speeds. The self timer or delay action, you can set that and see if it runs. It's not very enthusiastic. It's held in with a single screw. Lay these parts out neatly together so you know where they came from. I'm not doing that because I know exactly where everything goes. I don't need to. But if you're doing it for the first time, take great care to make sure you know where all the screws go. So this stuff here, underneath is all the flash um, sink stuff. And this is the latch that holds the shutter in the cocked position. This is lifted by the shutter release lever, uh, by the mechanism, which then releases the uh, main drive cam. Right, so I can unhook that spring and remove the two screws. Now take great care at this stage that you don't lose the springs. easily lost, that's not one of the worst that you can do without it. Take that off and take the moving flash contact off. I can get that lever off. There's a little flash contact just there which you sort of need to push back out of the way as you lift that off its post. Now I need to get a pair of pliers to help me lift that spring out of that lever there. So normally I put a screwdriver behind the end of the lever there so it doesn't swing. Grab the spring with a pair of pliers and I can stretch it out very slightly and unhook it. That way I didn't need to stretch the spring for miles. 
in order to, to disengage it, we can lift that off. And we lift that little that pallet wheel off. Now we get to some another spring that's this one's very easily lost. I'll zoom you in a bit. Now normally I hold a toothpick over the centre here so that spring can't get away and unhook the end of the spring carefully with a pair of tweezers and then lift the spring carefully out of the shutter and put it carefully to one side in a container so I can see it and it doesn't get lost. The next thing we need to do is remove the bee lever. The bee lever is held in with a single screw that has a spring on it. Don't lose that. We'll lift the bee lever off and then we have the bee lever spring which runs around a post here and I need to encourage that off the post. And it runs around a, a groove on that post, which locates it. So we've got those little springs carefully put aside where they won't get lost. That finishes the work that we need to do on the inside of the shutter at this stage. I prefer to work on the, uh, a wooden block. It raises the shutter off the bench top and it just gives you a better surface to work on. Right, so at the back of the shutter, we should have three screws which hold the shutter case to the shutter, the outer case to the shutter body. There's a small screw here. Just back that off a turn or so. That just clamps the flash contact. You don't need to remove that screw, in fact you shouldn't do, you'll end up losing it. So the three screws. This one head is raised and that's to engage with the camera body. It stops the shutter from rotating in the mount. Remove those three screws. These two countersunk head screws are not the same size. They're different size threads. And the outer case should come off the shutter. And here we've got the outer case the curved rack which is driven by the shaft from the camera body and this curved pusher which the rack acts on and then in turn pushes the shutter to cock it. Here's our shutter body. So in this case, because this is an early shutter with the 10 blade diaphragm, yeah that's very stiff. Um, in this case there are two small screws at the back here which hold the setting lever to the diaphragm mechanism. Take care not to lose those. Underneath this lever, which looks quite oily, there's a metal shim. That looks quite greasy. And underneath that, we have this lever, which is the settings lever for the flash sync speeds and the self timer. Now we're down to the basic case and mechanism plate with all the exciting bits taken off. Three screws at the back here run through the back of the case to the mechanism plate. Apply a lot of downward force on those screws so that you don't cam out and damage the screws. And these two should separate. And here we can see the case with the diaphragm in it. 
And those blades have a sort of a greasy look to them. And here we see the mechanism plate with the shutter blades. And again, you can see there's a lot of marks on these blades, and that's sort of a greasy looking mark there. Um, there's marks on the mechanism plate here. Not sure what that's about. It's vaguely possible someone has um, put something in here. I don't think it's been flood cleaned, but it certainly doesn't look good. Anyway, regardless of that, it needs to be stripped and serviced. Normally I start with the case and diaphragm. So there's three screws. Loosen those up. And tip the contents out. So here's our case. Here's the moving plate that is swung by the settings lever and moves the blades in and out. Here are our diaphragm blades. They're not especially greasy because if they were they would have stuck together. And here's the retainer plate that holds them in place. And of course three small screws that held the retainer place and plate in place. So certainly something's been put into the shutter and why I say that is that these diaphragm blades where they do not run over each other, this area of blade here for example where nothing contacts, that's got quite a dot that's got a, a deposit on it of something. Whether it's graphite powder or something, I don't know. I'll find that out when I go to clean them. So it looks like, you know, somebody's had a go at doing something in the shutter, perhaps. Perhaps with graphite powder. Difficult to say. Certainly it shouldn't be like that. Those blades should just be uniformly clean. I'll start with the case. So taking some naphtha. Cigarette lighter fluid. I'll swab that case inside and out to remove all the contaminants. It's Some of the black here, you could, that's probably graphite grease that was doing a job in a useful way. And the outside of the case, it's worth taking your time with doing a task like this because it's a simple task and if it's done well you're creating a good foundation on which to build as you put the shutter back together. Here I'm cleaning around the threads of the retaining ring and the inside there, that's where the rear lens grip screws in. And it, oil that is hiding in crevices here that you don't clean away will almost certainly find its way to somewhere you don't want it to be at a later date if you don't remove it. As you probably know, oil is the bane of leaf blade shutters. Once it gets onto the shutter blades, or indeed the diaphragm blades, it'll stick them together like glue. If any of you worked in sheet metal trades, you'll be entirely used to uh, sheet metal sticking together on a pile when you try to take the top sheet off a stack of steel you have to give it a very good shake to break that bond before it will move ok that case looks quite good now it's worth checking to make sure you haven't got any fibres of cotton left stuck on there which you almost certainly end up having if you like me this is the moving plate. Here 
handle these plates by the edges otherwise you'll end up leaving big fingerprints on the plate and your perspiration and skin oils will etch into it and leave a permanent record of who the clum clumsy person was who serviced it previously or indeed who originally built it because I have taken apart new old stock shutters that had never been in a camera and discovered fingerprints on them in exactly the same way and you can see here if I hold that in the light correctly that there's a fingerprint here and one over here and that's because somebody just grabbed it between finger and thumb and skin oils and perspiration they will most certainly etch their way into metal this is a good example uh, I've seen plenty where there's it's more fingerprints than other surface so that's clean and here we have the retainer one side of the retaining plate is against the diaphragm blades and the other side is against the shutter blades the plain side, the side with no indentations in it runs against the diaphragm blades and the shutter blades run on this side there's five tiny indents here where I think the pivot points for the shutter blades sit You can see a fair bit of dirt came off there. That should have just been clean. It's worth having a couple of goes at cleaning this because almost certainly there'll be contaminants down in the grooves that'll come out later if you don't. This is in good condition. same advice hold it by the edges or you'll leave fingerprints like the ones visible here and those fingerprints aren't just something to be ugly and annoy you they can cause grief